Hello everyone, and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This time, we're going to learn about some electrocyclic reactions and the Woodward-Hoffman rules that govern them. By the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer for yourself are how does an electrocyclic reaction occur, how are they thermally or photochemically driven, and how can I determine the stereochemistry of these reactions using the Woodward-Hoffman rules. If you need some review on delocalized pi systems and especially conjugated dienes or trienes, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and take a look at those videos I've uploaded on those topics. Let's start out by drawing out two prototypical electrocyclic reactions. The first of these is going to be the conversion of hexatriene, so this is a conjugated system again, and I'm going to draw it like this in its sort of cyclic arrangement, and upon heating, this is going to form the cyclic cyclohexadiene. So we can see that we've lost one of the pi bonds, and we've actually formed a new carbon-carbon sigma bond in our product. And this is allowed to proceed because the closing of this six-membered ring is exothermic. We know that these six-membered rings are very stable, so upon heating, this reaction will proceed quite readily. However, we can actually drive this reaction in the opposite direction, taking the cyclohexadiene and opening that ring using electromagnetic radiation of some certain frequency. A second reaction we can take a look at is starting with cyclobutene. So we just have one pi bond here. And again, we're just going to heat this starting material to actually open up the ring, in this case, to form butadiene. And in this case, the ring opening of the cyclobutene will be exothermic because we know that the four-membered ring species are quite strained, so opening up that ring will result in a more stable product. Just like with the previous reaction, we can drive this in the reverse direction using light of a particular frequency, closing the ring back to cyclobutene. If we'd like to draw the mechanisms for these reactions, they're actually quite straightforward. For the first case, with the hexatriene starting material, we're going to again draw this in the sort of cyclic arrangement, and upon heating, the pi bonds will all shift, so we'll have this top pi bond migrate over here, the pi bond on the left swing down, and this third pi bond will come up to form a sigma bond between these two carbons on the right, closing the ring and forming the cyclohexadiene product. Similarly, if we take the cyclobutene starting material, upon heating we will have the pi bond on the left here, swing up to form a pi bond between the top two carbons, and then this carbon-carbon sigma bond on the right will come down to open up the ring and form another pi bond between the bottom two carbons. And these reactions are named electrocyclic because they involve pairs of electrons moving in cyclic fashion, and they can be thermally or photochemically driven. So we've seen that we can drive these reactions using heat, but we're also able to drive the reverse reactions using light, so that will be the photochemical variation of these electrocyclic reactions. Okay, so the slightly more complex but also much more interesting facet of these reactions is their stereochemistry. So if we consider this substituted cyclobutene, where we have two methyl groups cis on the ring, and we expose this compound to heat, we know that we're going to end up with a butadiene variant. So we will have this butadiene backbone. And these methyl groups will actually be arranged in this way. So we will end up with the cis-trans variant of the diene as a product. Conversely, if we start with the trans variant of the substituted cyclobutene, and we heat this compound up, we will end up with almost exclusively the trans-trans variant of the substituted butadiene. Okay, so why is this? Well, we're going to have to take a look at the orbitals involved in each of the reactions. So let's go back to the first reaction, where we have the cis isomer of the substituted cyclobutene, and we can draw a simplified view of the orbitals in this cyclic compound. So we will have the cyclic backbone here, with each of the carbon atoms, and then we know that these methyl groups are arranged cis, so we'll draw those both on the same side of the ring, in this case pointing up, and each of these carbon atoms in the rear are sp2 hybridized, remember, so these are going to have p orbitals that form pi bonds. We can draw those p orbitals here, and then we will draw these sp3 hybridized orbital here in the front 
forming the sigma bond between these two carbons. And we know that during the course of this reaction, both of these carbon atoms in the front have to rehybridize to sp2 instead of sp3. So in order to rehybridize, they're going to have to rotate to have those p orbitals line up with the other p orbitals in the rear carbon atoms. And to do this, the bonds are going to actually rotate in the same direction. So we will have this methyl group on the left rotate clockwise from our perspective, and the methyl group on the right side will also rotate clockwise coming down here. And because these bonds are rotating in the same direction, we call this a conrotary mechanism. So then we can draw the final product of this reaction. Again, we have this carbon backbone. And the two carbons in the rear, remember, are still sp2 hybridized, so they're going to have these p orbitals where we get the pi bonds. And like we mentioned, we know that the carbon atoms in the front have rehybridized to sp2, so they too will have these p orbitals to form pi bonds in the butadiene product. Now finally, because the methyl groups have both rotated clockwise from our perspective, the methyl group on the left will be sort of inside the ring, so that will be the cis methyl group, and the methyl group on the right hand side will be arranged trans in that double bond, it's going out of the ring. Now we can draw a similar diagram for the other isomer of our starting material. So again, let's draw our carbon backbone for the ring. We have the two carbon atoms in the rear with the pi bonds, and then we have the two carbon atoms in the front, and we have that sigma bond connecting them. And in this case, we have the methyl groups arranged trans. So we can draw this one methyl group on the left going up, and the other going down on the other side of the ring. So like I said before, this ring opening of the cyclobutene with heat is a conrotary mechanism. So both of these methyl groups are going to have to rotate in the same direction. So we can draw this methyl group on the left hand side, rotating counterclockwise or anticlockwise. And if that methyl group is going counterclockwise, so too does the other methyl group have to rotate counterclockwise from our perspective. So if we want to draw the final product of this reaction, just like before, we will do the carbon backbone. And just like before, each of these central carbon atoms is sp2 hybridized, so they will all have p orbitals with which they can form pi bonds. And now, because each of the methyl groups has rotated counterclockwise, we will have both of the methyl groups arranged outside of the ring, which means we will end up with the trans-trans conjugated diene. You might be asking why the methyl groups cannot both rotate clockwise, given this isomer, and I'll leave that up to you to decide why that doesn't happen. I'll give you a hint that it has to do with the steric hindrance of some of these groups that are positioned on this ring. Remember, we always want to try to avoid steric hindrance when possible. Okay, so now what if we take a look at the reverse reaction? So we mentioned that we can take a conjugated diene, such as this compound, so this is the trans-trans variant of the substituted butadiene, and we can expose this to some light of a particular frequency, and we will end up with the ring product, so the cyclobutene, and both of these methyl groups will be actually arranged cis in this product. So this is the opposite of what you might expect if we just looked at the reverse of the reaction that we just did, but let's see why that is. Again, let's draw a simplified orbital picture of our compound. So we have these four carbons in the middle, and they are all sp2 hybridized, so I'm going to, again, like I have been, draw these p orbitals. And then this is the trans-trans variant, so both of these methyl groups will be going out of the ring. In this case, when the reaction is driven by light, the ring closing will proceed by a disrotary mechanism where these methyl groups are going to rotate in opposite directions. So the methyl group on the left might rotate clockwise, coming up from our perspective, and the methyl group on the right will be rotating in the opposite direction, so counterclockwise. And as always, let's draw the final product. So this will be the cyclic compound now, where we have the two carbons in the rear, sp2 hybridized, with p orbitals, and the carbons in the front, are sp3 hybridized, so we will have these sp3 orbitals forming a sigma bond between these front two carbons, and because both of the methyl groups have rotated up, they will be on the same side of the ring in a cis orientation. Again, I will leave it up to you to determine the product of this reaction, 
where we're now working with the cis trans variant of the substituted diene instead of the trans trans variant. And remember, because this reaction is driven by light, just like before, it will follow a disrotary process. So use that in determining what the stereochemistry of your cyclic product will be. Now that we've looked at the ring closing and ring opening of the cyclobutene product, we can look at the six-membered rings as well. So if we take a look at this substituted hexatriene, now this is the trans-trans variant again, and we expose this to heat, remember this will close the ring, so we will have a cyclohexadiene backbone, and these methyl groups will actually be arranged cis on the ring, so we can draw them both coming out of the page towards us. And this follows a disrotary mechanism. As before, I'll leave it up to you to draw out the orbitals if you'd like, and convince yourself that that actually is the case, that the methyl groups are rotating in opposite directions. On the other hand, if we have the cis-trans isomer of this substituted hexatriene, and we expose it to the same reaction conditions, this will undergo the same disrotary process, and if this is disrotary, that means we will end up with the trans substitution on the cyclohexadiene product. Okay, one more example. If we start with the cyclohexadiene starting material, and both of these methyl groups are arranged cis on the ring, and we react this photochemically to open up the ring, this actually follows a conrotary process. So conrotary again, meaning both of the methyl groups are rotating in the same direction. So rotating in the same direction will give us the hexatriene product, and these methyl groups on the hexatriene will be arranged in the cis-trans isomer. Okay, so that was a lot of examples to go through, but you may have noticed some patterns according to the size of the ring, and also whether the reaction was thermally or photochemically allowed. This brings us to what are known as the Woodward-Hoffman rules, and although I won't go into great detail on these rules here, we can look at some of the most basic statements. The first of these is that if we have an even number of electron pairs that are migrating in these electrocyclic reactions, so think for example the cyclobutene, either ring opening or ring closing reactions, that involves two pairs of electrons, these reactions will be conrotary when allowed thermally, so when we're using heat to drive these reactions, and they will be disrotary when photochemically allowed, so when we're using radiation to drive them. The opposite is when we have an odd number of electron pairs participating in the reaction. So for this time, think the cyclohexadiene ring opening and closing, which involves three pairs of electrons. These are disrotary when thermally allowed, when we use heat, and conrotary when photochemically allowed, when we're using electromagnetic radiation. So keep these rules in mind, and remember that they're sort of the opposite of each other. Whenever you're trying to determine the stereochemistry, or the products of these electrocyclic reactions. So I hope this video helped you understand the basics of electrocyclic reactions and of the Woodward-Hoffman rules that govern them. If you like this video, please go ahead and like and subscribe to my channel for more. Follow me on social media and look at my website, and if you're willing and able, please consider donating to my Patreon page, which allows me to continue creating these content for all of you. Thanks for watching.